it is a truth universally accepted that children ought to play. But where should they play? How often? What sort of equipment ought we to provide? What games do we allow them to invent? How fast is too fast? How high is too high? How far is too far? These are contentious questions in our risk-adverse age, so before I tackle them, I want to unify us in our mutual resolve to preserve play's vital place in childhood. So let's begin by discussing the critical work that play does in developing children physically, mentally, and spiritually. The benefits children receive from prolonged play, particularly outdoor play, are innumerable. Movements like spinning, jumping, climbing, and running all contribute to the healthy functioning of organs. These movements also develop crucial muscular and skeletal strength that both prevent injuries in youth and contribute to overall health in old age. Imaginative play helps children develop empathy for others, the social skills necessary to function well within a group, and provides respite from the pressures and expectations of the adult world. Interacting with the natural world through outdoor play also instills appreciation and love for God's creation. Despite this obvious necessity for outdoor play in childhood, the national trend over the last few decades has been to decrease outdoor play drastically, particularly in our schools. Our nation's public schools continue to shorten and even eliminate recesses in favor of more strenuous academic schedules, a direct result of school funding becoming dependent on standardized testing. Rather than increasing the quality of the educational experience, this nationwide move toward keeping students inside is causing long-term damage to our children. The epidemic of childhood obesity alone should warn us as a society that we are not providing for the health of our children. With an alarming growth in pediatric occupational therapy intervention for children of all ages, it is further clear that the opportunity for extended physical exertion through play, so crucial for childhood development, is no longer an assumed part of the average child's experience. Doctors and specialists are seeing increasing numbers of children with underdeveloped motor and sensory skills, poor bone and muscle density, and increased levels of anxiety and frustration inappropriate for their young ages. These factors combined with increased screen time and reliance on technology for stimulation are creating children who are incapable of entertaining themselves, who are physically underdeveloped, and are dangerously predisposed to a wide array of physical and mental disorders that will affect them for the rest of their lives. We can all easily agree in the face of these realities that our children need play and lots of it. This play must be rigorous and challenging and creative if we expect it to combat the host of ills that I've just described. When we were deciding as a school how we intended to approach outdoor play, we tried to keep all of this in mind. We set out to create an environment where students could interact with the natural world, challenge themselves physically, and take risks appropriate for their age and ability. We wanted to create something that was harmonious with nature and that left play open-ended so that students wouldn't get bored easily. We wanted our playground to encourage autonomy, resilience, exploration, and creativity. And this is how we ended up deciding to go with creating a natural playground here on our campus. The natural playground movement seeks to provide alternatives to the brightly colored plastic playgrounds that have become popular in the last 20 years, in part because children are bored more quickly on equipment that has been des designed with safety rather than engagement as the top priority. Interestingly enough, these uh, newer playgrounds are also statistically more likely to get, uh, students are more statistically likely to get injured on safe equipment than they are in more challenging play environments because they find a way to make it more challenging for themselves, right? <laughs> While the appearance of natural playgrounds is on the rise, we are proud to say that our school contains the very first natural playground that was built in the city of Houston. Our school worked with Natural Playgrounds Company Incorporated, which is based out of New Hampshire, to design and construct our playground. We met with students and talked about their favorite things to do when they play, and then we completed a 30-page questionnaire that identified the best playground elements to incorporate into our specific design. Unique elements of a natural playground include naturalistic materials such as wood, sand, rocks, an emphasis on varied terrain, hills, uh, and open-ended play features that allow children to use their imaginations freely. Our natural playground features grassy hills shaded with trees, shade is a must in Houston, a large wooden tree fort with a climbing wall and a rope ladder, which even our smallest four-year-old students are very thrilled to scale, um, a wooden balance beam and a hill slide that's surrounded by climbing boulders and stairs that ends in a sand pit. 
It will soon expand to include a large climbing wall and other more challenging climbing features for older children. A small cave, kids love caves, a wooden amphitheater, a water play feature, and several circles of stumps and boulders for jumping and sitting. It was less expensive to build, and it's less expensive to maintain than traditional play equipment. It's more beautiful, it's more physically challenging, and most importantly, the students think it's more fun. Finally, the playground also functions as an outdoor learning environment since it is a habitat for many species of local plants and creatures. Our students directly engage with the resident insects, birds, and flowers as the seasons change, and our teachers are able to incorporate these encounters as supplements to classroom instruction. Our students love our playground. We have watched timid students learn new skills and gain confidence in their abilities. We've watched kids of all ages playing together, inventing games, building contraptions. Most of all, the students love the freedom they have to dangle from tree limbs, run and launch themselves from the tops of hills and into the air, <laughs> clamber over boulders, and climb up the slide. Climb up the slide, yes. That's right, they can climb up the slide if they want to. This is the difficult part for most adults who have been agreeing with me so far. We don't make prohibitive rules against many of the things other schools forbid when it comes to play. Why are adults comfortable with the tenets of free play, but uncomfortable with them in practice? I think it's because when it comes down to it, it involves acknowledging that our children need to take consistent risks. Most kids love danger. Anecdotally, many of us here can probably agree that many children seem to seek out dangerous situations with relish. Well, this was actually proven in a 2007 study that was done in Norway where researchers observed children at play in an attempt to identify patterns in behavior and types of play that were specifically intentionally sought out. Various groups of students or children of various ages were observed playing in a number of different environments to see if there were any common play behaviors that manifested. Turns out there are, in fact, play behaviors that kids tend to engage in no matter where they're playing, who they're playing with, or how old they are. The study found that children tend to, one, play with heights, particularly where there's a risk of falling. Two, play with high speed, particularly uncontrolled speed and pace that could lead to collision with a person or object. Three, play with dangerous tools like sticks or rocks. Four, play near dangerous elements like waters or boulders or cars or other machinery. Five, engage in rough play with each other, like wrestling or play fighting. And six, play where children disappear or get lost by wandering away and hiding from a group. <laughs> Does this sound like the children you know? So we have to ask the question, what is so attractive about all of these play behaviors? It turns out they have something pretty clear in common. They all involve perceived risk. We all take risks in our daily lives because we understand that risks can have positive outcomes. Asking your boss for a raise is a risk. So is hitting snooze one more time in the morning, traveling to a foreign country, running a red light, or proposing marriage to your girlfriend. When adults take these risks, we recognize that a negative outcome is possible, but choose to take a chance anyway because the positive outcome is so appealing. We perceive the benefit and are willing to take the risk as a result. When people consider taking a particular action by identifying and weighing potential outcomes, they are practicing risk assessment. This is a skill that adults use constantly, and we need it, but it's one that we start developing long before we grow up. Well, we develop it before we grow up if we're given ample opportunity. Adults are increasingly depriving children of this key part of development by taking the possibility of risk out of play. When the stakes are low, taking risks has benefits that far outweigh potential consequences. That's why allowing risk assessment on the playground is such an important opportunity to give students the time and space they need to explore their own abilities and limits. How high can I climb? How fast can I run? These are questions we can't answer for students. They have to find out the answers to those questions themselves. Some kids are fearless and need to take risks in order to learn through failure what they can and can't handle. Some kids are fearful and need to take risks in order to build confidence and discover that they are stronger, faster, or more able than they thought. Practicing risk assessment is the healthy way for both types of children to learn, even though they have opposite attitudes toward play. Developing new skills like balancing on a beam, jumping from tree stump to tree stump, or climbing a rope ladder can take time and sometimes do require failure. This might mean scrapes, bruises, and even sprained ligaments or, strained ligaments or broken bones. 
But kids' bodies are very resilient, and this is how they learn what their bodies are capable of and how far they can reasonably push themselves. This skill continues to pay dividends as their bodies mature, and their risk management begins to translate to cognitive, social, and emotional assessments in addition to physical ones. They need to learn to match their skills with the demands of their environment, which can only be done by allowing them to experience risk in increasingly challenging environments. When we don't allow students to practice assessing, tackling, and overcoming risks, we think that we are protecting them from very real present harm. In fact, we are opening them up to more serious harm in the future when we can no longer control their environment all the time. How will they know their limits once there are none imposed on them externally unless we give them space to test themselves? The risks that children choose to take sometimes make little sense to adults, perhaps because we have forgotten what it's like to be a child or because we haven't played in a long time. We watch children struggle to climb trees and tell them to stop because to us, the risk has no positive outcome. The negative outcome is clear. They could fall and get hurt. What is the benefit of climbing a tree, we ask ourselves. Surely, whatever it is, it can't be worth this risk. But this is a governing principle of play. Humans are motivated to play for the sheer pleasure of it. It is a good unto itself, with no incidental benefits required to make it worthwhile, though as we've discussed, there are many benefits. Play must be deeply fun. I can use fancier words like facilitating social interaction for increased creative imaginative development, but it's still just fun. To a child, a tree should be climbed because of the pleasure of getting into the branches. This is what makes the risk of falling worth it. And there's nothing wrong with that, even if we as adults don't exactly understand. Now, before we go on, I want to be very clear about something. A risk is different than a hazard. I rely on a host of play theorists and researchers for my definitions of these two distinct terms. A risk is any situation in which there is an unknown outcome that could be either beneficial or harmful. A hazard is a source of harm that can't reasonably be assessed or accounted for, especially not by a child. Uh, I could sprain my ankle when I play soccer at school. This is a risk that's worth it to me because of the benefit of enjoying a soccer game. But if I fall into a giant pit during the game, I am the victim of a hazard. I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't have to be looking out for giant pits while I run around on a school soccer field. Here are some examples of common playground hazards. These are things that students should not have to worry about while they're playing, and these are things that adults should strive to eliminate from play environments, and we do at this school. Uh, so here are some of them. Hard surfaces under equipment, inadequate fall zones or poor playground surfacing, lack of maintenance or broken or faulty equipment, uh, inadequate supervision, pinch points and sharp edges. How many of you have been nicked by metal playground equipment in your childhood? Ooh, not good. Uh, protrusions and tangling hazards. The number one cause of death on playgrounds is asphyxiation. Overcrowded play areas. And finally, contamination with dangerous items like broken glass or syringes or giant pits. Uh, through careful planning, implementation, and maintenance, it's possible to provide children with a reasonably hazard-free play environment. And it's the responsibility of adults to do so. We have worked very hard to eliminate these hazards on our natural playground at this school. Our treehouse has a fall zone made of wood chips. Our slide is built into a hill, which makes falling off of it almost impossible. Our equipment is less than a year old at this time, but we already intend to have it regularly checked for structural integrity. By sticking to mostly natural materials, we avoid many of the dangers that largely plastic or metal play environments pose, including sharp edges and pinch, pinch points, and also general decay, which is a common problem with plastic equipment. We always have one adult supervising recess breaks for every seven to eight children. Our students have the run of about three acres, so they have plenty of space to play, too. As I was thinking about how important all of this is to our school's philosophy of education, I decided to try my hand at writing a school mission statement for the way we approach and value play. I'm gonna try it out for you. At the St. Constantine School, it is our mission to create the best possible play spaces and opportunities which will attract children, capture their imaginations, and give them scope to play in a more challenging, in more challenging, more exciting, and more creative ways. This play will enhance their abilities and well-being and foster wonder and desire for understanding of their father's world. I'll read it again one more time. At the St. Constantine School, it is our mission to create the best possible play spaces and opportunities which will attract children, capture their imaginations, and give them scope to play in more challenging, more exciting, and more creative ways. This play will enhance their abilities and well-being 
and foster wonder and desire for understanding of their father's world. You will notice the word safe does not appear in this mission statement. Now, the statement does say that it's our mission to create the best possible space and opportunity for play, which we do in part by ensuring safety in the ways that I've already talked about. But safety qua safety is not part of our mission of learning through play. Safety, it turns out, is not a good in and of itself. For one thing, perfect safety is impossible to achieve, no matter how vigilant we are or how prohibitive our rules may be. This is a lesson we are often taught in ancient Greek tragedies where no human effort can stop the inevitable, or in fairy tales like Sleeping Beauty. If you think you destroyed all the spinning wheels, you're wrong. Think again. Children will get hurt sometime, somewhere. It's unavoidably true. They fall, they stub toes and jam fingers, they get splinters, they get sand in their eyes. And this all happens no matter how carefully we watch them or how safe we make their environment. The harder yet still unavoidable truth is that some children will get seriously hurt despite all best efforts. Broken bones, loss of limbs, paralysis, and death. All of these things have happened as a result of playground accidents in the United States, at restaurants, parks, homes, churches, and at schools. Now, when I talk about this, we all get knocked in our stomachs. I have just described many parents' worst nightmare. This is why we worry about letting our students take risks. We know that these children have been entrusted to us as their teachers, and we take that very seriously. However, as Christian educators, we also know that these bodily injuries are not the worst injury a student can suffer. Physical harm is nothing compared to spiritual harm. We believe there are forces in this world that are actively seeking dominion over the hearts and souls of our students. The classroom is a battleground where teachers fight off the pessimism, boredom, skepticism, moral relativity, and cruelty that threaten our students on every side. It sort of puts concerns about playground safety into perspective, doesn't it? Whether families realize it or not, they are risking something far more serious than their students' bodily safety every day when they drop off the kids at school, and that's at any school. Why are all these risks worth it? What do we stand to gain letting children try things that could hurt them? As we discussed earlier, there must be some possible benefit that outweighs any possible harm for the risk to be worthy of our efforts. I propose that we must take these risks in school because it is how we reach the deep, abiding, rich meaning that is available to the one who seeks God's truth in this life. We must study languages and history and music for our salvation and to the glory of God. We must read difficult books by dangerous men, grappling with ideas and philosophies for our salvation and to the glory of God. We must learn to count, then to add, then to solve equations, then to contemplate the perfectly ordered universe as revealed to us through number and mathematics for our salvation and to the glory of God. And we must climb trees and roll down hills and catch bugs and pretend we're horses Strengthening our bodies, learning resolve and courage and kindness and camaraderie for our salvation and to the glory of God. So, these are the risks we take with our students every single day at the St. Constantine School. But how will we keep them safe? If we must take these risks, can we guarantee that no harm will come to any of them? We can't. And I'm so sorry that that's true. Our impulse to want to create a perfectly safe environment for our children in the face of uncertainty is a perfectly understandable one. Of course we want our children to be safe. We don't wish them any harm. That would be ridiculous. But it is wrong to keep our children safe if we do it by keeping them away from what is good. I am reminded of a passage in C.S. Lewis's classic children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The four Pevensey children have stumbled into a magical land called Narnia and are now snug in the cozy house of their new friends, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. 
and have just eaten a delicious dinner. They're safe. The children have just heard for the first time of the White Witch, an evil queen who has held Narnia enslaved for hundreds of years, and of Aslan, the powerful lion and true lord of Narnia, whose return they desperately desire. One of the children, Susan, expresses concern over the fact that Aslan is a lion and asks if he is safe. I'll read you Mr. Beaver's response. Safe? Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. May we press on as a community of all ages, working and playing and learning, forsaking that which is merely safe and seeking together what is truly and deeply good. Thank you.